Well, hello, welcome to the B2B Growth Think Tank. Now, as entrepreneurs, business leaders, we tend to be visionaries. We love looking into the future and coming up with innovative ideas, products, services, entire businesses that can make a real impact on the world. Now, unfortunately, in order to turn any vision that we have, it does require a little bit more than simply coming up an idea for a better mousetrap, right? And I guess this is painfully evident in the rate that business failure is, is reported. And depending on where you get your statistics, that can be anything from 75 to 95 percent in the first five years. And those that do succeed, there is there is something that they share and have in common in that they have a solid understanding, even in just sort of theory or in just sort of a grasp of this is concept, even if they don't know it by this name of the diffusion of innovation. Now, this is a predictable path that almost any new business, product or service goes through on its path to profitability. But most people don't understand or cater to each of the stages that go with this. And crucially, they don't understand the importance of a segment of your market known as the early adopters. Now, this it's not the same as your mainstream market which means that your strategy needs to be completely different. And if you don't do this, it's where a lot of things tend to go wrong. So the good news is today that I'm talking to someone who has an actual business doctorate, meaning she's a practitioner and not just one of those stuffy academics that sits in an office, in taking an idea from concept to full market adoption and commercial success. Now, as a healthcare commercialization strategist who helps health tech innovators unlock their path to profit, she has transformed 20 years of business practice, seven years of re researching over 500 peer reviewed articles, and she's interviewed over 160 people um, to turn this innovation process into a repeatable method to go from idea to full scale adoption. Now, today she's the founder of Legacy DNA, where she advises startups and emerging healthcare brands, and is the international best-selling author "How to How Health Innovators Maximize Market Success: Strategies to Launch and Commercialize Healthcare Innovations." And so, even if you're not in the healthcare space, you're going to want to pay close attention because this is applicable to any business, any product, any service. So. Keep your ears open, take some notes, because I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my guest today, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Roxy, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Adam. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. Well, and it's thanks an for that absolute lovely pleasure. introduction. <laughs> well, you know, you and I know each other pretty well um, these days. And yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, it's not necessarily something that has always been in my consciousness around those stages of development. And, and we've talked around ideas like commercialization, early adoption, and, and not everyone necessarily understands what all of that means and, and, and why you need to really at least have an awareness of it when you are launching, you know, and, and this could apply to launching any kind of campaign as well. So before we dive into the nuts and bolts, what sort of got, what, what got you started on this path? To where you are now. Yeah. Um, so I started Legacy DNA as a healthcare marketing agency a little over 10 years ago. And a few years in, I decided to go back to school and get my doctorate in business. And prior to that, I had worked with a number of healthcare startups. So I saw that we were on the precipice of this explosion of innovation in healthcare. And this is like the early 2000s. So it, it, it kind of looked like it was going to be very exciting for this industry and what was going to be happening. And But I come across this statistic that 95% of innovations that are brought to market fail to reach any adequate level of uh, customer adoption or financial ROI. And that really just struck me because really, whether you're in the US or any market, you know, healthcare, the cost of healthcare are so significant. And, and so we're all trying to figure out how do we solve this big problem that we're facing. And I thought, how in the world are we really going to solve this if majority of the innovations that these people are bringing to market, like really smart people bringing to market, don't get in the hands of the people that need them the most? And so at that point, you know, it was just very clear to me that I had a lot of passion and enthusiasm for solving this problem. And that was going to be, you know, my career going forward. And, and here we are today. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a few things in there. And I mean, that's a shocking statistic, 95%. And, and is that from, is that come from your own research that you've sort of arrived on that? And I, I touched on a few statistics that it depends, you know, with business failure, for example, 75 yeah. to 95, depending on where you read it. But where, where's that sort of number come from? 
So um, there's a there's a peer reviewed article, a strategy review, and also a Harvard Business Review article that um, talks about research and, and quotes that statistic for some mm. studies that they've done. So it wasn't my primary research that I conducted, but it was the secondary research and sources that I use for all of my doctoral work, and it was just really alarming mm. to me. And I want to you know move the needle. I want to help mm. people beat the odds and be more successful. So those innovations can get into the hands of the people that need them the most, because in healthcare, lives are at stake. Quality of yeah. life is at stake. You know, we're not just talking about the next, you know, tchotchke for another, you know, in another vertical. <laughs> mm, absolutely. And, and and that's a huge problem then that you solve, because essentially what you're doing is flipping it on its, on it, on its head there. And you're saying that you, you, you have this framework, this, this model, that you can take people through. And my assumption is that you can apply that and it's applicable to not just a health innovation, but the model would work essentially if you're looking to create any kind of product or or the, the, the thinking behind it would work if you're trying to, to come up with a, a service idea, launch a new business, um, or, or, or even think about the way that you would approach a marketing campaign because the steps that you would go through are similar. And you actually take and flip it on its head and you say, I can put you in the 5%. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely foundational business commercialization strategies that are applicable to any vertical, any industry, um, any product or solution, just like you mentioned. And so why don't you give us an example of what your process or what that framework is? And, and and maybe give us a real life example of how you've taken somebody through it. And maybe between the two of us, we can maybe talk about how that could actually apply to a different type of business to bring it to life a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So, so one example that I like to use is just when we're talking about timing strategies. So most innovators think about timing of when are they going to go to market? And it's usually when it's done, when the product's done, that's my strategy mm. <laughs> without really any other, you know, strategic consideration. And so part of what I, um, part of what our framework does is it kind of, um, shows innovators the distinction between being first to market and being a second follower or um, a, a, a late follower and what are the pros and cons so there's not a better strategy a lot of times innovators think that they have to be the one that's first to market not realizing that there's a lot of disadvantages of being first to market um, it's extremely costly to create a whole new product category if you are bringing something that's really radical and disruptive to the industry um, and also you know because you're first to market there are um a number of uh, assumptions that you're going to the market with. And so if you're, a, if you're a follower into the market, you not only want to think of, I'm going to market when the product is ready, but how am I going to position my innovation um, in my timing strategy in a way that is very strategic? So mm -hmm. if I'm going second to market, I want to be analyzing that first to market player in depth. I want to be seeing what their customers are complaining about and what that gap is, and then making sure that I'm configuring my solution in a way that solves the problem that the first to market player doesn't solve. I think an example of that um, could be Spotify. Right. So Pandora was probably the, at least in, in, in the US, was the first, um, you know, digital music player to come to market. And then Spotify came in and just swooped and cannibalized the market. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, so it wasn't about being first, um, but it was about being really strategic and kind of thinking about that timing and the characteristics of the strategy um, that you decide to move forward with. Yeah, that, that saying of um, you can always, it's come to mind, what is it? The You can always spot the pioneers because they're the ones with the uh, arrows in their back. And <laughs> yeah. it, it does, I mean, it sort of brings to life that everyone thinks, oh, well, that's been thought or done before. I couldn't possibly make an impact with it. Or I've got an idea, but oh, there's someone else doing it. I'll, 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 I'll leave it. Whereas actually, let's be honest, there aren't many new ideas or brand new ideas that are invented under the sun. They're always an iteration on something else. And I mean, examples for me that come to mind are, um, you know, the greatest example is Apple, I think, and 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 all, a lot of the products that they are now famous for, they didn't invent them. Right. Um, Microsoft invite, it invented the, I think it was Microsoft invented the uh, smartphone. They definitely invented the MP3 play, player. 
um, which became the iPod, which blah, 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 blah. But they weren't first, but they quickly overtook them because they were able to take that, I guess, that holistic view of what was going on in the market and see how people, it was It was like their competition was doing all their market research for them. <laughs> and they were able to literally listen and see what was going on with the product, what people liked, as you say, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. they just came in and, and, and made it like Apple is today. And right, they are right. the most successful company in the, in, in the world. So I think that's uh, one thing that also jumped out there for me was it's it's spotting the gap. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and, and it's something that I refer to as, as the value gap. Because just because you do something that's the same as others, there is something there that can either be improved on or is is not existing in a service or a product or a business or something like that. And you can come in and fill that gap. Now, you have to be able to identify it. So what would you, how would you take someone through that process or the, or the, or the exercise of potentially uncovering or discovering that gap? Yeah. So, you know, in my mind, that kind of takes us back to a positioning strategy and really being able to analyze the competitive landscape and and really mapping it out in a good old fashioned four by four grid (laughs) and plotting all of the competitors um, on this X and Y axis. Right. And kind of coming up with what are those variables and, and then where's the hole. And, and so again, as we're thinking about it, you know, with being, um, leading customer first or problem first instead of product first, right? So we might have an idea of a product, but if it's not positioned in a way that fills that unique gap in the market, then we're just a me too product and me too products can be successful, but they are a lot more difficult to be successful with something that is just a me too solution than literally figuring out where you're going to position yourself. The example that I like to use is Chipotle in, in tacos. Um, so here we have a brand called Chipotle, which is, um, you know, um, uh, um, antibiotic free meat that's used, right? So, I mean, like whoever thought that we needed like another taco brand, I mean, there's taco brands everywhere, but this market, I mean, this company came in, they obviously did their, their strat, their competitive analysis, figured out where they could carve out their space. And, and so there, it's a very different avatar or a very distinct customer that buys from Taco Bell versus Mm -hmm. that buys from Chipotle. And Chipotle has lines and lines of people every day, all day, buying their product. <laughs> so yeah, it is I mean, we've, finding that gap. I'm trying to think. I, I don't think we've got Chipotle here. I mean, we've yeah. got. A, I mean, we we have inherited the obsession for um, burritos, and <laughs> <laughs> it's evident in the fact that my eldest daughter, when you say Molly, what's your favorite food? She goes burritos every uh, time. So right. she absolutely loves them. Anyway, yep. but I I think it's it's yeah like when you go back when you sort of scale out a little bit further there is also what you're looking at that you you're you're competing in a fast food market and there is huge competition in that and to be able to look at it and 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 i mean you might say that going specifically for a mexican style restaurant is niching enough or however you want to say it but they went even further and they found that gap the thing that people were looking for and yeah the rest is is history in, in terms of uh, the success that they're having over there. So when it comes to, obviously, we mentioned a little bit about early adopters. How would you define an early adopter and why are they so important? Yeah. So er, so if we think about the diffusion of innovation curve, which I didn't come up with, Rogers did, and, kind, and it's surprisingly, um, I think this is like in the 50s that he came up with this theory on the diffusion of innovation. And the idea is that any technology product goes through this certain diffusion process and he sliced up the market. So I think most of us, when we think, um, especially B2B brands, when we think about how we might segment the market, we're usually talking about multiple stakeholders that are involved in this buying process and we might segment the market by that um, by that but what Roger encourages us to do is to go deeper and say even within any market there are also these characteristics of their buying behaviors that tie to this diffusion of innovation curve and the early adopters are those first two slices so the innovators are the 2.5 percent and the early adopters are 13 and a half 
enough. And when you combine that, you know, I call it the 16% of the market and kind of group them together. The innovators are those people that they kind of don't care whether something really works or not. They just want to tinker around with something. They they want the new, never been done before. Um, but but you can; those are going to be the people that are going to help you with your co-creation and help you figure out um, what's working and what's not, and give you feedback. You probably don't even have to pay the innovators for that feedback because this is just ingrained in who they are. They want to tinker around. Mm. The the next segment, those early adopters, um, the thirteen and a half percent, those are the people that still want to be first it, to have access to something. So they have a little bit of a higher expectation on the performance of it, but they're still not expecting things to be perfect. Um, and they like to tinker around a bit too, but more importantly, they're the ones that want something that their competitors don't have. They want to leapfrog the competition. So they're always scouring the market to find out what is new and exciting, hasn't been done before that they can leverage as a competitive advantage. And, and help grow and, and scale their company and yeah, yeah go ahead. no i i mean i i think that you can you can probably describe a lot of people that work in and i guess in in our industry really because when you're when you're working in marketing you're always looking for that edge sometimes that can be detrimental because it could be a shiny object that you get distracted by and go chasing squirrels and and end up down a black hole of watching a hundred thousand youtube videos on how to do something Yes. Trying to figure out how to make a chatbot work or, or something like that. Um, yes, I've done that. Um, yep. <laughs> but it's, <Guilty. laughs> it, it brings to mind, though, that that's why you need a totally different strategy, because the messaging to those kind of people are going to be very, very different to maybe the the, the laggards or, or, or whatever they may be called yep. that are coming yep. later that are inherently by their nature far more risk averse and they will have a lot more a, a lot different criteria for making their decisions than the people at the beginning so you need to appeal to you know to those different and you need to understand that even if you get the innovators well you kind of would have got those anyway the early adopters are the ones where you learn the most and you need to have a way of getting them but then you then have to almost completely switch your strategy to go to the mainstream market because they won't appeal or they, they won't be drawn by that same message and the same yeah. positioning and, and all the rest of it and also potentially not even the same features and benefits yeah absolutely so from a messaging standpoint those two first slices of the of the curve those folks they are going to appeal to messaging that says new different never been done before be a pioneer kind of thing whereas if you use that messaging for the mainstream market you would scare the hell out of them and they won't take your call because they're not looking for that right yeah. <laughs> um yeah. we fear change no we don't want to change yeah they're looking for the industry <laughs> industry standard yeah right they want the tried and true everyone's all everyone's already kind of poked holes in it and 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 validated that this is safe for us for our company for our business and so the messaging strategy is very distinct and then there's also something that's really important that um uh jeffrey talks about in his book crossing the chasm so there's certain things that we have to do with those early market segments in order to cross the chasm and get to the mainstream market. And that is getting those first buyers to become raving fans and spread the word. So having a word of mouth strategy is extremely critical in the early stages. Otherwise, um, those that mainstream market is not going to believe what the brand says. So if the brand comes out and says, well, we're the industry standard it's not going to be nearly as powerful is if, if the early market themselves are the ones that are saying, you, you know, this is awesome. I had success with it. You should check this out. Um, it's a it's a, it seems like it's just really um, um, a little small thing that maybe isn't that important, but it's actually really critical in being able to cross that chasm between those early adopters and the mainstream market. And in order to have success with the mainstream market, you have have to have success with the early adopters well i i think you said something there that would have definitely pricked up a lot of people's ears um that that, that listen to this show and that is the uh, the word of mouth strategy because 
a lot of B2B businesses, we, you know, we build on relationships, on word of mouth, on referrals and all that kind of yeah. thing. So from from your extensive experience, what, what makes a good word of mouth strategy, one that is actually pre-considered rather than, let's face it, a lot of us are guilty of leaving it to chance? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We just think that they're going to love us so much that they're going to think of it all on their own to take time out of their day to tell everyone how awesome they are. Uh, we are. And, and honestly, what tends to happen is that if it's a negative experience, <laughs> that's when the, the word of mouth is happening without being triggered, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and they do say there's no such, there's, there's no such thing as bad publicity, but I'm, um, I'm, um... I don't necessarily buy that. (laughs) Right, right. No. I mean, honestly, so if those early adopters have a bad experience, you're never going to scale to the mainstream market, right? Um, But I I think having a specific strategy that's tailored to, you know, what we would call affinity marketing, right? And in being able to, um, so sometimes we think of it as like, you know, that buyer's journey that we're just trying to get people in the funnel and then we're just trying to convert them. And we forget that next step of advocacy and making sure that we have a strategy to nurture customers to become advocates for us. And and there's so many tools to make that really frictionless um, for today's buyer. Uh, A tool that we use is uh, Video Peel. And and it's so it's allowing um, customers to be able to solicit video testimonials from their customers. Really, you just like text them a link and it just does basically all the work and they're on camera and they hit send. And and so, you know, emailing someone and going, hey, would you give me a testimonial? Would you create a video? I mean, that's it just doesn't happen. We all have good intentions, but we just get busy with our own businesses and our own responsibilities. But I've noticed that when you send them that that text, you get that video testimonial and it's not the corporate speak polished talking heads that the brand would likely put out. Um, so that authenticity um, becomes a lot more powerful. Mm. And and what was that tool again? Just so the listeners can can check and also uh, make a note that because I know people love tools, right? So yeah, yeah. Video peel, video peel.com. Video peel. And I know that um, uh, the makers of type form, I've also got something similar. Okay. Video, video yeah. ask. It's a similar kind of thing, and, okay. and and I don't know if it's the same. So there's a couple of tools if you want to talk, sure. sort of experiment with this this uh, th- this approach. And and I can tell you that it's yeah. Um, everyone that comes on the podcast, you haven't received it yet, but you will get a video ask. No, well, and there you go. <laughs> it will go to your phone, and it's just <laughs> hey, just tell me what you thought of the show. Give me some yeah. feedback. Yeah. And it's fantastic because I'm starting, I've I've only recently implemented it, but it's starting to really get me some, uh, you know, people talking about the show, which is fantastic. Um, So I, you know, word of mouth is something that is incredibly powerful. And I think it's massively important to understand the difference between, certainly when you're launching something, when you're in the early stages of growth and all that kind of thing, you have to appreciate that what you're going to do to get past that stage is going to be different to what you're going to do when you achieve a certain level and then and all the rest of it is that it's that old saying of what got you here won't get you there and i don't i think it's the hardest thing for people to accept sometimes because it's really hard to give up the things that have got you where you are and you know work and then you've got to then do something do something different and that's one of the things that i find a lot of people wrestle with because it's like well uh, i'm scared of trying something new Um, yeah but i think it's vital I describe it as really like putting on a pair of sunglasses or a pair of glasses and putting on the early adopter glasses. And so at that stage of the business, you are not worried about anything to do with the mainstream market, what they want, what they need or anything. You are you are really focused on building a strategy for those early adopters and winning mm-hmm. those those first customers. And it's only later once you've started to get close to that 16% that then you're taking those glasses off and now you're putting your mainstream glasses on and you're building your strategy um, for the next phase of the business. Mm. Um, and, And that's just so important. What I find, especially in B2B companies is that 
we end up mix, we, we don't do this type of granular segmentation and we mix it and we have in something that's innovative that we go to market with and we in unconsciously are trying to pitch our solution to the mainstream market. And we waste a lot of time, a lot of money trying to sell someone and nurture a relationship that is absolutely never going to buy until we get that 16% and they tell them that they should buy. And so I've seen businesses literally go under because they've been courting the wrong potential customers for the wrong stage of their business. And are there any characteristics that would identify an earlier adopter or, or, or is it different industry, industry to industry, product to product? Um, uh, there, it, it doesn't vary from industry or product. So there's, um, early adoption characteristics, and then there's late adoption characteristics, um, you know, income, education, mm -hmm. some of that demographic stuff that we're really accustomed to, but we aren't necessarily thinking about how we would use that demographic data to segment based upon early adopters or late adopters. I mean, I, I'm assuming you couldn't literally line up a bunch of people against a wall and you could sort of pinpoint what they would look like in yeah. terms of is it is, is can you can you get it down to that precise sort of you know if could you estimate with with a certain amount of certainty right i could tell that person because i guess maybe the clothes they're wearing the things that they're carrying and, and all that kind of thing maybe there is an indication yeah. of, of what type of person they would be okay if someone is still using a flip phone they are not your early customers right <laughs> I mean, that's just a really obvious example, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but as, as we're, you know, in the sales process, coming up with questions that are specifically tailored to being able to identify that um, early on in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that way we don't think, oh, well, this is just a long sales process. So I've got to nurture this relationship for 12 to 18 months. Like we literally have those questions teed up from the very beginning and we can kind of you know, not necessarily box them, but put them in the box between those different segments. Um, and then say is, and, and again, not to say that we don't necessarily keep them in the database and kind of nurture them in the long term. Um, whenever we have those word of mouth uh, customers that we want to share with them, but not expecting them mm -hmm. to be those first buyers. Yeah. And, and, I guess it's it's all down to a lot of their behavior, the kind of things they read, what they watch, yep. websites, how often they use particular, you know, anyone that has not yet got a TikTok account, for example, wouldn't be an early adopter for a new social media channel. Right. That's me. Thank you. Please don't ask. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get on another social media. <laughs> I'm addicted. It's like I need therapy. I love yeah. that. I love that platform. I don't even watch TV anymore. Mm. I'm just watching TikTok. It's like my new prime time TV. <laughs> yeah. And yet when it comes to something else or other things, I will be an early adopter because right. that's the thing that, uh, that that's, you know lights me up and it excites me and it's, it's interesting. Whereas those sorts of things, no, I don't have... I don't have interest or time, um, right. so I don't want to get distracted. So what I'd like to do now is is I, I want to pose the challenge that um, has come in this week. And um, what we like to do with guests is just brainstorm maybe a, a few, you know, if, if this was being asked to us and maybe it was being asked to you, what, what would you sort of um, advise somebody did as a result? So this, uh, this week, um, this should be going out in, uh, in in January time, so um, it will be apt considering people are going to be thinking about what to do over the next 12 months, and hopefully it will be a much better year than 2020. So yeah. if someone said to you, in, in the current climate, should I continue to create things like a five-year plan, um, considering all the uncertainty that's going around, or should I be focusing on short-term, looking for short-term results? Good God, no, not a five-year plan. I would say not even a one-year plan. Um, I think one-year plan, annual plans are completely outdated. Those are going to be um, obsolete before you ever get to executing it. Uh, I think that that's a recipe for failure, putting together these long-term plans like we used to do years ago. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I, I agree when you use the term five-year plan. I do think it's important to have a five-year plan goal or a five-year yep. vision 
Yeah. And I think it's quite an important distinction because people will get the two a little bit confused because if you don't have a kind of vision or an idea or a direction where you want to go to, that's when you can sort of, you know, using my, my constant fishing analogies, it's when you can start drifting on that open ocean, right? With yeah. no, you know, you're just a victim of the current or where the wind is going to take you. You've got no rudder. So it, when it comes to thinking five years ahead, it's what do I want my business to look, feel like? What kind of, how do I want my life to look like? How do I want it to fit into all of that? Who am I helping? Who am I impacting? What, what is that doing in the world? That's the sort of thing you think about in five years time. But no, right now, I mean, you can't necessarily make a plan for a, right. for a single day because I mean, <laughs> I'm, 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 we're doing this now and I'm looking out my window and I live next door to a pub. They were open again for um, what two and a half weeks. They've mm -hmm. invested in outdoor spacing and all that kind of stuff. And today they've had to shut because we've just gone into a, a tier three lockdown. Now they couldn't plan for that, but they planned for the short term. They planned for what was happening. They knew that if they increased their outdoor capacity, they were going to be able to bring in more people. They brought in the ability to do food, which was part of the uh, way to actually get people in. So yep. that's an example of, yes, focusing on the short term results because you need to be able to do that. You have to be agile. You have to be able to move quickly. So planning and sticking rigidly to a, to a plan is, is a fool's errand at this point. But it also does help to have that direction. And at least yeah. if you're thinking a year out and you have to understand that, okay, I will have certain financial obligations that I need to meet. So therefore I have to be able to plan effectively to how to reach those objectives. And I have to understand how many clients, how many sales, et cetera, et cetera, that I will need to make in order to achieve those. Absolutely. Then you can yeah. break it down into 90 day sprints and things like that. But so the way I would. Yeah. So the way I would define the difference is really being clear on the difference between the why, the what, and the how, right? So if we've got our purpose, our why, our why is that rudder that's guiding our businesses and our why doesn't change. That just stays tried and true throughout the you know, duration of this business that we've launched. But the what and the how can very much change. And so as we're thinking about like marketing strategies and plans, those to me are the how and how we do something this week, like you just described with the pub example is very different than how we might do it in 30 days. Um, I encourage folks to do um, short cycle planning, kind of like what you're describing around 90 days. So you, so the other thing is kind of like, um, I think that we have to be careful when we start saying that, that people think that they're just going to every day throw something in the wall and see what yeah. sticks, right? And kind of like, you know, what you're saying is what's the balance of that? Like you absolutely need a plan. And for those of us that are innovators and visionaries, we can get caught up in that shiny uh, uh, new opportunity syndrome, right? We've all been guilty of that. Mm. We live and in the future. That's the thing. You're <laughs> able to project yourself there. But you've forgotten you don't have a teleportation machine <laughs> and you've actually got to make the journey. Yeah. And it's frustrating for teams that are trying to operationalize our why and our vision um, to be pulled in multiple directions. So they're like, a uh, plan? Yes, let's have a plan, please, and let's kind of stick to it. And so there's definitely this balance between having our how plan mapped out for 90 days, but still being agile, being flexible, and I think also being data centric. And, you know, because as marketers, we have access to um, and insurmountable behavioral data and, and performance data like never before, you know, how something performed, being able to assess that and being able to determine what we need to do next. We might have thought even within this 90 day plan that we were going to do something in month three and we realized that no, it actually makes sense to, we're going to have higher impact if we do this tactic instead of mm. what we had originally planned. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, a few things that, that sort of I, I, I get from that is the importance of being um, agile, the ability to create a culture within a business that allows you to pivot. And yeah. I know that's something that you have a very good methodology around helping people to actually, when the situations happen where it's like market situations change, like dramatically. I mean, this 
pandemics is a great example. Yeah. How you actually go through the process of assessing the situation, working out well, what's the worst case scenario if I do nothing, and then actually I need to figure out a way to pivot and what does that look like? And, and pivot has been used as a bit of a buzzword lately, but it is something that really, really does describe the value of that. But I don't think you can do that unless you have a culture that is actually going to, first of all, see the need and then actually execute on it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, you know, I think of uh, this book that I read not too long ago, Experimentation Works and making the case of, you know, kind of creating this culture around experimentation and giving a lot of examples um, that we can relate to. Whereas, uh, you know, Microsoft with Bing was, you know, they had a plan in place on what they were going to do with it. And they experienced, experimented with a bunch of different hypotheses and in real time um, and really giving permission to employees to experiment, giving them permission to f- have some failed experiences, experiments, because not all of them are going to succeed. Um, and realizing that for Microsoft, within um, a, f- a minor tweak, they were actually to generate another billion dollars worth of revenue. So, I mean, these can be some very valuable experiments. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think from the leadership down, um, thinking about creating this culture of experimentation and uh, failure, you know, we see a lot of tech examples, Google, Mm -hmm. Microsoft, that just do this all the time. They're running thousands and tens of thousands experiments a year. I think it's vital. And and I think the last thing to maybe... um, uh, that, that comes to mind for me around this thing about around the planning and, and all the rest of it. I think it's an important distinction to make the difference between projects and process. Mm-hmm. And you'll recognize this because yep. <laughs> <laughs> we've had this conversation. I've heard this before. Yes, you have, but it's, it, it really does. I, mm-hmm. I think it really fits here because mm-hmm. when you're making a plan, you're planning essentially to imp- or, or continue implementing a process that has an outcome that you can, that you can rely on. Now, obviously, if something happens to make that process um, basically redundant, you have to look at uh, redoing the process. So it's like, you know, a spanner in the works, you, your, your, your production line is, is literally shut down. What do you do? You have to figure out a way to fix it. Um, but the projects that you plan to execute over a 90 day, six month year, those are the ones that you need to sort of take a bit of a step back and say, actually, what are the things that I need to do in my business that are going to have the biggest impact on ultimately the bottom line, my revenue, what is going to move the needle and planning those projects, but not to the detriment of still continuing to do the processes. Because once you have done the experimentation, and that's why it comes to mind, which goes inherent of running a project, you can then create the processes that work in the business to operationalize it and then continue to do the projects and the experimentation and all the rest of it. And I, 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 I got that from where you said talk yeah, about the experimentation yeah. thing. And I, I think it's an important distinction to make. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, when we go back to like just agile, there's still a process for agile, right? Mm. So, um, you know, our teams are planning the work every week and planning the sprint. And so there's a process that gives a little bit of organization and structure. So although Mm. the work might change from week to week based upon how we're going to, you know, have the greatest impact, um, Mm. that the the planning of that work um, and how we're managing resources is Mm. very structured and systematized. Otherwise you won't have a scalable business and you'll, we'll have a lot of frustrated team members <laughs> yeah because they don't know where they're going right they don't know yeah. what they've got to do next and that's yeah. one of the most frustrating things that can happen and i think it's why it's one of the most valuable things that you can give to an employee a team member a client anything like that and that is a clear path a clear roadmap yeah that guides somebody where they want to get to and and i think that that can that 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 if there's one thing that any business or any service provider or anyone like that can can really sort of take, I think, out of this. It's what is your process for actually helping somebody achieve a result? Because mm-hmm. that's what you should be thinking about in your planning process. And yeah. how can we make it better? And what projects do we need to complete in order to help and improve that? So, yeah, that's uh, that, that went in different direction to what I thought it <laughs> might go. But it's uh, I think it's valuable, especially um, around this this uh, the particular time in year and depending on when you're listening to it, maybe, uh, you know, 20... Uh, 
47 i don't know um, <laughs> you know that's the beauty of these things they stick around for a while so um yeah i mean one last thing to sort of um, touch on because you've got all of this knowledge and all this um, experience and, and stuff like that what do you find is is been for your own business one of the most effective growth strategies that you employed whether it's a marketing thing a way that you've um, positioned yourself what, what what have you found to be probably if you had to st- you know hang your hat on it what would you advise that somebody was looking to do so the way i describe it is a thinking partner so no matter how much knowledge and expertise you have it is absolutely impossible to not have blind spots and to see everything clearly so like i said no matter how much success we've had having a thinking partner that is external to the company i think is really critical for growth for leaders like ourselves to be able to um, bounce ideas off of Um, so i think this person plays plays a lot of different roles accountability um um also you know telling us our baby's ugly (laughs) um (laughs) especially for you know visionaries like us um you know and adam and like what you've done for me is to be able to say no 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 we're kind of getting caught up in shiny opportunity syndrome we need to stay the course we need to follow the process um or even being that mirror to saying like hey you know you tell your clients this but you're not really practicing that. And for that self-awareness um, to be to, to really come through only that trusted thinking partner that you're working with, um, I just think is absolutely foundational for having any kind of successful business. It's, it's very, you know, we don't accomplish great things on our own. So it's very rare that you talk to anyone that's a successful person that doesn't have um, mentors and coaches that they're mm. working with to help them build and grow their, their empire. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm beaming because I, I I agree with you in terms of the the value of 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 having a thinking partner or a uh, uh, some form of basically a second pair of eyes. Yeah, it's 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 someone that you can you you, you trust and you trust their opinion because you know let's be honest, especially like, I can imagine in your world that there's so many people out there that have had an idea for um you know a, a, an innovation and they've gone and blurted it out to their their better half. And they've gone, oh, that's a stupid idea, blah, blah, blah. And that's killed it. How many yeah. lives have been impacted yeah. as a result of that or never right. to be positively impacted? Whereas if you have someone that you actually trust that, and I'm not saying you shouldn't trust your other half, obviously, but, but it's <laughs> right. more like they will just, they, they, there's so much more there um, wrapped up. They're not objective and, and all the rest of it. But if you took that to a person, a group, whatever it may well be, yeah. and sort of said, what do you think they might say that's terrible or they might say think you got something it needs a little bit of work in this area or i don't think you've necessarily considered this or that or whatever it is so yeah i think it's incredibly valuable in terms of kind um, of on this soapbox lately of this idea of hippo um and it's an acronym for highest paid person's opinion or highest paid person in the office and I have been guilty of being the hippo. And a lot of times I think as um, as owners, as CEOs, we can be looked at as the highest paid person in the office or the highest paid person opinion. And so when we say we should do something or we shouldn't do something, our teams might have a tendency to just acquiesce to what it is that we're saying um, instead of um, pushing back. And, you know, I think it's, you know, and I I would pride myself on someone that creates a culture of truth. Like, Mm. tell me the truth. If you think Mm. this is a terrible idea, let me know. But Mm. I think still sometimes as leaders that, that not always do people say this is a terrible idea. Like you want to do it. Okay, let's do it. Oh, you want to try this idea tomorrow. Okay, let's do it. And, and so I think that this thinking partner, this coach, this, you know, mastermind, whatever that looks like can kind of help, um, diminish or reduce some of this uh hippo that we (laughs) take down the hippo in the room (laughs) well i always you know i'm I'm always one to get any kind of um like nature references into anything (laughs) and uh all the rest of it maybe i'll uh, i'll steal that as well um but yeah i i couldn't agree more and um we've i've had people on the show 
previously talking about the value of masterminds what they've got for it i've yeah done done ones myself create you know have a group as well as that that, that offers this and and they you know different groups will offer different things but absolutely mm-hmm. we can't do it alone i mean no. it's absolutely uh-huh. impossible um no matter how much uh, we think we are superman so um, <laughs> roxy that's that this has been a fantastic conversation as always um but i think for anyone that maybe want to find out a little bit more about you what you do um maybe sort of have a look at your methodology and all that kind of thing where's the best place to find you and connect with you yeah so connect with me on linkedin dr roxy mooney um you can find me on twitter as well uh, my handle's roxy mooney and um then check out our website uh, legacy-dna.com fantastic and um Obviously, there's there's people out there listening that that might not necessarily be in a in a healthcare space. But what about a, um, somebody that would be a good alliance for you, a good partnership, someone that you could add value to with what you do, but you wouldn't necessarily um you know you're not you're not competing with or anything like that. But what, what's the sort of um person that if they're listening and thinking I like what Roxy's got to say, I'm not really going to be in that place, but I actually could yeah. see some value in here. What, what sort of person should that would, would that be? So I would say technology developers, product developers, that's the first groups that kind of come to mind is those folks are usually coming alongside some similar people that we're working with. They're building the solution that the innovator has. And so being able to collaborate and partner with them and being able to help make sure that what they're building is actually destined for success instead of just building something for their client that they think already out of the gate is doomed for failure for a number of reasons they're just Mm. not going to talk about it because they're hiring us to build it so we're going to build it (laughs) Mm. absolutely and and i can even imagine you know things like accelerator uh, people that run startup accelerators all those kind of things or 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 i guess other companies that that sort of serve a similar type of um they, they solve a similar problem but maybe for a different market or they are looking to add a methodology that is that is literally data backed and they can go to a you know potential client and say, look, we are looking, yeah, we are working with this person, and and yeah. or, or maybe they could even come in and, and and talk to you about sort of licensing your IP because it works for so many Please. industries. There's so many opportunities for what you do out there. It seems a shame for it to just sort of <laughs> live in one world. It's like let's yeah. get it out there and help more people to yeah. To, product to... developers um, across co- uh, companies, across verticals, we, mm. we could certainly license our framework to them. Um, also, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a startup. It could even be more of a large, large global company that's been around for for decades. You know, those companies usually mm. have div- innovative divisions. Mm innovation divisions that they're using to kind of be that incubator with inside the company. And so being able to partner with them and being able to use this framework. So it's, you yeah. know, company anyone with a research and development function, anything like that. I mean, that's the beauty of what you've got, like the yeah. model, it's based on principle, it's data backed and, and, and it works. So yeah, I, I, I think it should be in front of as many people as possible. So um, yeah, I agree, if you, if you are Adam, out there, do If it. you are out there and you and you can sort of see a value in this kind of process, that you can add value to your clients or, or you can add value to your own business by maybe partnering with, with someone like Roxy and, and bringing something different, then yeah, check her out. Give her a good, get, get in contact. Tell her you heard it on the show. So um yeah roxy just thank you ever so much as always it's been a pleasure talking so um all that's left to say is um see you later thanks adam thanks for having me on the show it's been great